glad that Martin Eiswander is here tonight. We're in our ninth, our ninth overtime meeting. It's a good thing. No, there's no better place to be on a Wednesday night. Nothing better on television or online. <laughs> also, so glad that Martin Eiswander is here with us tonight. Before I say that, let me just mention, if you can help us with expenses of ongoing conference, whatever you can remember to put in the offering baskets after the service will help toward that. And I um, wanted to mention also that uh, we have Rick Burgess with us Friday night. I think about eight or 900 people have already bought tickets, but if you want to get one of those, I think you can get that on the way out. Praying that the Lord's going to speak in that as well. And so glad Martin Eiswander could be with us tonight. We felt like uh, he's been a part of this conference from the beginning because uh, he was here for our fall conference last year. Uh, during that conference, he spoke on revival, on personal revival, revival in the church, revival uh, in a region and community and beyond. And we felt like going into the conference as we were preparing in the beginning of, as we were preparing in late April for the conference, that uh, the words that had been spoken during that fall conference were especially significant going into the spring conference. So. All of our leaders listen to those messages again. Many of you listen to those messages again. And I think really raised our expectations and level of faith and what we were coming and asking for and looking for. So I know that uh, Keith has been keeping Mark apprised somewhat of what's been going on here. Some of you don't know also that uh, when we were about to plant this church, Mark and Rich Stevens had just started a church in Kentucky. And um, so I got to spend some time with them, and uh, they really gave me some direction on different people to look at who had been planting churches. Their church was the first church I'd ever seen that had a break in the service, so we are heavily indebted to, to, to them for that time of coffee and fellowship. And uh, then about a year after we had gotten started, he came and did our very first conference. And uh, so we're excited that he's here tonight. Appreciate you coming down from Atlanta. Looking forward to what the Lord's going to say to us through Mark tonight. Amen. We well, influence you with coffee and revival. That's uh, can't beat that combination. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, Keith and Ralph have shared with me a bit about what's been going on and what a, what a delight. Uh, I appreciate so much as I've heard what is happening, how you're stewarding what God's doing here. Uh, you're not trying to hype it. You're just trying to follow the Lord, be sensitive to what he's doing. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm so grateful for your tenderness to the Spirit, your willingness to, to meet every week and come out and uh, see what God has for you. I I, um, I told Rhonda that after the singing, uh, God's in the house. Uh, I, I could sense him. He's very, very powerful here and uh, um, just a uh, delight to be here. You know, I, obviously, we don't need to try to define what's going on. It's just a time of refreshing. But I, I, one of the things I, I wouldn't, I, I felt like the Lord gave me a word for you guys, uh, a number of things uh, I'll be sharing something in a minute, but specifically uh, right here, I, I felt like he said, don't let the more get in the way of the more. <laughs> uh, and I, what, I, what I'm sharing here is that during the Welsh revival, Evan Roberts, right in the middle of that revival, it, it had reached its peak, and uh, Evan Roberts felt like the Lord said, I want you to take a week and seek me for more. <laughs> and so when he told everybody that, they said, hey, you're crazy. You can't. There are people that want to see you. They want to take this revival to other nations. You know, you, you can't take time out. He said, no, that's what God says. I'm going to go get in my room and pray. And he did. For a week, took time out just to seek the Lord. And uh, because of that, the, the revival spiked to a whole other level uh, because he was seeking God. So my encouragement to you, yes, God is moving. It's more than what you've seen last year. <laughs> but I think he has even more. So don't settle for the more now. Keep asking for more. 
uh, say, Lord, we, we know that there can be such a display of your grace on the earth that it could shake an entire community. And uh, we're not going to try to make that happen. We're not going to try to uh, market it. We're just asking you, God, to increase what you're doing in our midst and take it to the level that you desire for us as a people. And we make ourselves available to you as vessels to receive what you're doing. And I know your leadership team is praying and seeking God as to the steps to take and what the Lord would have you do. And I, I just, I'm very encouraged, not only with what God's doing here, but the way you guys are, are uh, seeking to steward what he's doing here. So I thought maybe uh, before we get into the message, we'll do that. We just spend some time in prayer asking the Lord for more. And um, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like uh, his, his presence is so sweet and uh, so heavy in the place tonight. I'd like for us just to, uh, if you can, you don't have to do this, but if you can, I'd like for you to kneel where you are. And uh, I'm going to lead us in some praying uh, before our, our, our Lord. Don't, and if you can't do that, don't feel bad. Just sit where you are. Or if you'd like to stand, you can do that. Uh, you don't have to kneel, but I just thought it would be good for those who could to kneel before the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we come into your presence and we are so grateful for this expression of your love over this community, how you're showing yourself so strong in this place through your spirit. And uh, Father, our hearts cry is that you would increase what you're doing, Lord, that you would take it to the next level for the sake of this community, Lord. For the sake of Dothan, for the sake of the surrounding area, Lord, for, for even the sake of our nation, Lord, we pray that you would begin to create pockets of true uh, outpourings of your spirit over the earth. And uh, Lord, I pray specifically for Harvest Church and for the churches in this community. Father, I pray in the strong name of Jesus, pour outer spirit and even greater volume upon this place lord accomplish what's in your heart may jesus have fame over this community may his name be spoken on the lips of people who don't even know him now lord we pray that there would be such a sweep of your spirit over this place that uh, that the nation would turn to this community and ask what is going on here Lord, you said in the last days there would be such an outpouring that it would turn Israel to look and say what is happening and become jealous for what you're doing among your people. Lord, we pray that you would give us a token of that, that the community around here would become jealous for what you're doing in a mighty move of your spirit through your, through your church in Dothan. So, Lord, we ask for more. We ask for a greater measure of your spirit in this time. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. We're so grateful. We're so grateful. And I pray that every person in this church and those that are coming to visit, I pray that everything you want to do in their heart and life would be done to position them, Lord, to position them to reach out into this community with your grace and transform lives by your power. We love you tonight, Father, and we thank you for Jesus. Father, we thank you that you've given us Jesus and that by his death and resurrection we have life. And we bless you tonight for your faithfulness in our midst. And we pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen. Well, um, as you remember, I don't know if you remember when I was back in the fall, I, I talked a little bit about my pilgrimage in uh, reading and studying about revival and even beginning to hunger for revival and one of the things I told you was that uh, I've asked the Lord for tokens now a token is just a little sample a taste of revival and he's done some things in me personally and and I count this as a token <laughs> he's given me another token of a refreshing in a church where he takes this we pray that it'll be to a full-blown uh, revival outpouring in this area uh, but obviously God is moving and he's doing some things here. So I'm so grateful for what the Lord's doing here. And, and I'm grateful for the invitation to come down and, 
and kind of get in on this. Uh, uh, but uh, when I was with you, uh, Ralph mentioned that I shared four messages dealing with revival. And actually, I've just completed a manuscript on revival, and I'm praying for a publisher to try to get that out. But I, I want to continue with you on, uh, on, on some of the things that I was saying. And basically, in this, this series, I, I'm looking at different dynamics that you find in revival. And Ralph mentioned we looked at uh, revival power. We looked at uh, revival in our heart when I was here. We looked at revival culture, how a church needs to have a revival culture. And then we also looked at a revival worldview, how we should have a, a worldview of revival where we're constantly pursuing the next outpouring of the Lord. This is where the, this, we're still in the dispensation of Pentecost. <laughs> and it's our right and our inheritance as the church to see God move and to see his sp spirit poured out. So we looked at those four things. Tonight, I, I really felt impressed as I talked to Keith and hearing Ralph uh, that I, I want to share with you about revival love. And this is, uh, I think, very important for I, what I think God wants to continue to do in your midst. I think he's doing this at some level. I would love to see it at the level that we read about when we uh, read uh, the revival under uh, John and Charles Wesley and George Whitfield, and particularly the Holiness Revival in the, last, in the 1800s. I want to read a, uh, you remember last time I was here, I read a, just passages from revivals. And uh, I'm going to read a passage, just a brief uh, narrative from uh, the revival under Jonathan Edwards. Or, or, it took place in his church. Actually, there were two churches that had uh, two revivals that happened at Northampton, where Jonathan Edwards was the pastor up in New England back in the 1700s. Uh, one was around 1738, and then about uh, eight years later, another revival came in 1742. That's the one I want to just take the narrative from that. It kind of got started because George Whitfield, who was Wesley's companion in England and was preaching revival in England, came across the ocean, not on Delta, but on a boat, <laughs> got over here, uh, preached in Jonathan Edwards' church, and it uh, triggered something, and uh, they began to see a stirring of the Spirit in the church, and then uh, several uh, weeks, or several months later, almost a year later, a full blown revival came when Jonathan Edwards was away ministering out uh, into other churches. Uh, he had a friend of his, a pastor Buell, to come and preach at his church, and that's when the revival broke. So this is just a portion of it, and I'll be referring to it a little later on in the message. In the month of May, 1741, a sermon was preached to a company at a private house. Near the conclusion of the discourse, one or two persons there were professors, meaning believers, not academic professors, but they professed Christ, they were believers, were so greatly affected with a sense of the greatness and the glory of divine things that they were not able to conceal it. The affections, I like that term, the affections, the affections, their love, their love, the affections of their mind overcoming their strength and having visible effects upon their bodies. About the beginning of February 1742, Mr. Buell came to this town. There was a very extraordinary effect of Mr. Buell's labor. The people were exceedingly moved, crying out in great numbers in the meeting house, and a great part of the congregation commonly staying in the house of God for hours after the public service. Mr. Buell continued here a fortnight or three weeks after our return, there being still great appearances attending his labor many in their religious affections being raised far beyond what they had ever been before, and there were some instances of persons lying in sort of a trance, remaining perhaps for a whole 24 hours motionless. Uh, these are not Pentecostals. <laughs> these are Congregationalists, reform people up in New England. Uh, but this is a, a great move of the Spirit in the 1700s. Now, I'll be referring to that in a minute because uh, during that revival, Jonathan Edwards' wife, Sarah Edwards, had some incredible experiences, and I want to refer to that in a moment. Here's the, here's the scripture I want to share with you tonight. This is Romans 5.5. 5. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit 
whom he has given us. Now, as believers, the Spirit of God pours out the love of the Father into our hearts, and we have a felt sense of God's love for us. If you're a believer here tonight, you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you should have a level of a felt sense of God's love for you. If you don't, Wesley says you need to go and ask God for the witness of the Spirit because you ought to have it. You ought to have within you a sense of God's love towards you as a child of God. But during revival, there's another kind of love that's poured out. It's the, it's the love of God, and it's also felt within us, but it's not a love for us. And this is the most unique factor of revival. It's the most unique factor of a move of God. That there is a love that we feel within us, but it's not God's love for us. As a matter of fact, this unique love is, I think, very important in order to understand what is really of God and what isn't of God during a revival. Now, maybe you think that, hey, you know, I can kind of figure out what's of God and what's not of God. I mean, I've read about revivals. I've heard about revivals in other lands across the earth. And so I think I could kind of figure out what's of God and what isn't of God. But there's a problem with that. Uh, I, I like this, great, this quote by uh, George Wogg. He says, revival in the history books or in Africa sound wonderful. Revivals in your backyard can be a headache. And, and here's why. Because we tend in reading of revivals in history or even read of revivals in other parts of the world, we tend to romanticize them and clean them up. But you need to understand a revival is a very dynamic thing. The outpouring of the Spirit is a very dynamic thing. I'm talking about a full-fledged revival. And a lot of things are happening. And uh, sometimes it draws lesser elements into the movement. And so it, it takes a great deal of wisdom to navigate a work of God. I'm so grateful for the team that you have that are praying and talking and sharing together to ask, you know, what's going on? How do we keep tracking with the Lord? Unfortunately, a lot of people don't do that. It may leave it to one person and they can kind of go haywire there or some group that kind of gets extreme. But, but revival many times can be very turbulent. And in order to navigate a revival, you need a, a, you need a reference point. In the turbulent seas of revival, you must have a reference point that says, this tells us it's of God. We can follow in this direction because this is the reference point that God is here and God is working. And fortunately, in all revivals, I believe, God gives us that north star that that is the, the thing that guides us to navigate through all the things that can happen in a move of God. And that North Star for revival is this unique love that I'm talking about. So the question is, what is this unique love? Let me read a, a, a word from Jonathan Edwards. Again, Jonathan Edwards is probably one of the greatest theologians Americans ever produced, but he was also a revivalist. And he believed in the moves of God, and he saw two of them, two significant revivals in his church in Northampton. He said this, now hang on, this is kind of Puritan language, so it's complicated, but I'll try to uh, make it a little more simple for us in the 20th, 21st century. He says, God hath had it much on his heart. One of the big, biggest things on God's heart from all eternity is to glorify his dear and only begotten Son. And there are some special seasons that he appoints to that end wherein he comes in omnipotent power. So what Edwards is saying is God's deepest desire is his love for his son. The father's desire is his love for his son. And one of the ways that he exalts him in the earth is to periodically send these outpourings of omnipotent power that makes the fame of Jesus even greater over a people. But here's what he's saying. 
that the unique love that I'm talking about during revival is a felt love, but it's not a felt love of God for us, although we do experience that in revival. We do feel God's love for us, but here's the amazing thing. In revival, we actually feel the Father's love for His Son. And let me tell you, if you get drawn in to the white water rapids of the Father's love for the Son, you're in for quite a ride. Because His passion, His passion for the Son, His passion to exalt the Son in the earth, His passion to complete the work that the Son has begun in redemption and in resurrection, His passion for His Son is incredible. And the wonderful thing of revival is that we get to experience that within our life. That's one of the things I want you to be praying for. God, would you make that happen here? I mean, I know you're experiencing God. You're experiencing his presence in some sweet ways. But I'm talking about the deepest dimension. We can actually be included in the love in the Trinity. Be drawn into that powerful love between father and son. John Wesley, when he talked about this love, this unique love, he called it, he called it perfect love. It's perfect not because we're perfect, but he says if you can enter into this love, it's God's love and it can do incredible things within you. As a matter of fact, in the early uh, Wesleyan revival, there were significant experiences where people were entering into this dimension of love and it was radically altering their lives, the way they lived, the way they choose, the way they thought because they were suddenly caught up in God's view toward Jesus and it was changing how they were choosing for Jesus and seeing Jesus and living for Jesus. And so Wesley called this perfect love. It became the fuel that fired the holiness revival in the 1800s. I was reading a book not long ago by one of the uh, holiness leaders, and he was talking about perfect love. And as I was reading it, I thought, man, this is kind of dry. You know, I can't understand how this kind of dry doctrine could ignite a revival. And then I turned to the last chapter, and it explained everything. Because it was his testimony. It was his testimony at a holiness camp meeting when he entered into perfect love and a powerful experience in the Lord. And when he came out of that, this Methodist preacher who was nervous about the holiness movement <laughs> was suddenly thrust into the middle of that revival and became a strong preacher in that revival. Why? Because he entered into the Father's love for his son. And it changed the way he lived. Let me give you a, just a taste out of the Wesleyan revival and the holiness revival. Just some brief testimonies. These are people, you need to understand, they're not talking about doctrine here. They're talking about experience. These are people that encountered a level of God's love that disrupted and radically altered their life. It turned it upside down. Because they were experiencing the father's love for his son. Francis Asbury, the man that Asbury College, Asbury Seminary named after. He was the uh, American, one first American bishop, Methodist bishop here in the United States. He came from England, young man, came over here to the United States. He said this about his experience, this encounter he had with this love. He said, my heart is melted into holy love and altogether devoted to my Lord. He's saying, from this experience, that's what's happened to my heart. It melted my heart, and suddenly I found my heart was just altogether devoted to the Lord. Here's another one, Ann Hester. Uh, excuse me, Hester Ann Rogers. She was an early Methodist lady under Wesley's ministry, and she's talking about her experience now. I sunk down motionless in this experience, being unable to sustain the weight of his glorious presence and the fullness of his love. Overwhelming love. William Hunter, another man in the Methodist revival. My love to Christ was like fire. 
I had such views of him as my life, my portion, my all, as it swallowed me up. And then this is Daniel Steele. He was a part of the Holiness Revival in the middle 1800s. Listen to this. Talking about his experience of perfect love. My physical sensations were like those of electric sparks passing through my bosom with slight but painless shocks melting my hard heart into a fiery stream of love. These people are not talking about a doctrine. Yes, it is a doctrine. It's a doctrine. Perfect love is a doctrine. But they're talking about an experience. They're talking about encounter with God. Encounter with this love of God for his son that radically alters who, who they are. The father wants you to enter his love for his son. I want to encourage you in these days to ask God for perfect love. Not your perfect love, but his perfect love. Wesley said we can have it. Matter of fact, he said believers should have it if we're going to live the life God's called us to. That this love can so transform the way we think, the way we choose, the way we live, that it radically alters not only our life but the community around us. I, I was telling Ralph at supper tonight, I, I really have a burden on my heart that we would see another holiness revival. But you need to understand, to see a holiness revival, there must be these encounters with God of perfect love. Holiness revival is not just people trying to live better lives. <laughs> a holiness revival is not just us standing against the culture and the way it's going. A holiness revival is an encounter with a holy God and our being transformed by his love flowing through us toward his son. So that as Daniel still says, suddenly we have this fiery stream of love flowing through us. I, I want to encourage you as a church to, to cry out to the Lord. Lord, give this to us again as a church. This, this as a church, this is your foundation. Any of us who, who see ourselves coming out of the Wesleyan stream, this was this was the explosion that brought everything into existence. Such a, an encounter with God and his love that people were radically altered by this. And it was an experiential reality. So I, I'm praying, Lord, do this again. Give us a heart for this perfect love. Let us see another revival of holiness in the land. Not because of we're living better lives, but because we're encountering a holy God who's radically transforming the way we think and the way we live and the way we act. Expect God's fiery love for Christ in you. Listen, you already know God's great love for you in Christ. Now expect God's fiery love for Christ in you. His love for his son in you. Now, I need to warn you, <laughs> this perfect love is beautiful, but it's disruptive. <laughs> It'll disrupt the way you live. It'll disrupt the way you think. It might even disrupt your reputation. <laughs> We're talking about something that's, that's, that radically alters life. When Paul used the word, God pours out his spirit in us, that's a very dramatic word. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the great reform pastor, said this, that poured out is a very strong term, and it is one that the apostle under divine inspiration was led to use, and we must not minimize the term, poured out. What does it mean? It's the picture showing God emptying on us the full force of his love all at once. A massive outpouring 
of love upon our life as an individual. That's what these people were talking about in the Wesleyan Revival. He said it was so massive it overwhelmed me. So massive it transformed who I am. The picture shows God pouring out his love in this massive way. The same term is used for the spirit at Pentecost. Joel says God will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Now, I mentioned to you about Jonathan Edwards and Sarah Edwards. I want to tell you a story about the, the second revival that hit uh, at Northampton. I, I mentioned that Jonathan Edwards was away doing ministry somewhere else when this Mr. Buell, a very close friend of Edwards, came to preach at the church. About five days before the revival came, Sarah Edwards, this is Jonathan's wife, suddenly began to weep. She couldn't get away from weeping. She was weeping day and night. And she said she was weeping because she felt like the love of God was just beginning to draw near. She could tell something was impending, something was coming upon them. And so she was kind of constantly crying before the Lord. I'm going I'm to kind of read this because it's, uh, and, and this is taken from a, about a five-page narrative. So I'm, I've just picked up selections. So just listen to this. At home, his wife weeps for days because God is drawing near. On the fifth day, revival love is suddenly poured out upon the church at Northampton, and Sarah Edwards goes down under the massive volume of God's affections. Four days later, she wakes up in her bedroom. Four days later, four days in the spirit, receiving this infusion of love into her life. As friends tell her what's happening in the revival, she springs from her chair in joy and again falls out under the Spirit's power. Through the night, Sarah enjoys indescribable currents of God's love. On day 10, hearing more revival news, she starts jumping for joy. God's love is so overwhelming her that Sarah collapses. Sometime later, people help her to get around because she's so weak. Two weeks into the revival, Sarah hears about the outpouring her husband is seeing in his ministry. God's love again overpowers her. Friends worship in her bedroom while Sarah walks around in some transported state. The next day, folks share revival experiences with her and Sarah dances with delight. Now believe me, that is a very brief synopsis of uh, several months in which the Spirit was moving. Now, Sarah tells this, one of the nights in which God was moving in her heart with this love, she says, this is what she said I was experiencing. She said, my heart and soul flowed out in love to Christ, she explains, so that there seemed to be a constant flowing and reflowing of heavenly and divine love from Christ's heart to mine, and I appeared to myself to float or swim in the bright, sweet beams of the love of Christ. It seemed to be all that my feeble frame could withstand. Now, he, here's what I want you to hear. I'm not, I'm not talking about the intensity of Sarah's, I'm not talking about falling out in the spirit. I'm talking about the disruptive power of this love. You might experience this love and there may be no physical manifestation, but let me say it will still disrupt your life. It'll disrupt the way you think. It'll disrupt the way you choose. It disrupts the way you, your priorities in life because suddenly you're in the stream of God's, the Father's love for Jesus and you're wanting to exalt him and love him and make him known to everybody around you. And so, yes, Sarah's experience was very dramatic and very intense, but the point is not the intensity but the disruption. And whether the experience comes with intensity or not, it disrupts our life. And that's what I want you to hear. There is a cost in this love. There is a cost in it. And that's why I think surrender is the way into that love. I was amazed at the uh, song selections, Keith. Uh, I don't guess y'all have ever had that happen before. <laughs> Singing about love and surrender. But that, that's the way into it. You say, Lord, I don't know what it's going to look like in my life. I don't know where it's going to take me. I don't know what it's going to do for me. But my heart's desire is to experience the full force of your love for your son in my heart. And I'm willing to surrender to that. It's disruptive. 
Now, I know the intensity of Sarah's experience can kind of shock us. But let me say this. One day, every knee will bow to Jesus. Every knee. So why does it surprise us when revival love buckles a few knees and rearranges the human heart and the human will? Whatever its intensity, this kind of encounter is needed in this day. As a matter of fact, I think it's the only thing that will save the day. This kind of outpouring, this river of God's love for his son. Now, how did Jonathan Edwards feel about the experience of his wife? Well, when he got back and heard what all went on, he told Sarah, he said, Sarah, I want you to write it down. And, uh, and you can find her testimony. It's pretty long, and like I say, it's Puritan language, so it's kind of, uh, it goes, goes on much longer than we go on today. But he said, I want you to write it down. And then at the end of her testimony, Jonathan Edwards wrote this. To make sure, because he'd been criticized a lot for the revival. It cost him a lot to have the revi the, for the revival in Northampton. And so he wrote this. He says, if there are any critics of Sarah's experience, understand one thing. If you think my wife has some kind of mental disorder, then I want you to know that I want this happy disorder to be mine forever. <laughs> It was out of that experience that he wrote this, his massive volume, Religious Affections, in which he described how our lives can be overwhelmed with an affection for God, an affection for Christ that's beyond anything we can come up with because it's the love of God being poured out within us. So, it's disruptive. But here's the other thing I want you to hear. And, and, I, and I think this is where you guys are right now, not only as you ask the Lord for more, but also begin to give yourself in this way. The transforming love of God is also transferable. It can be given away. And that was what the great thing in the early Methodist movement. Francis Asbury said, we want to spread scriptural holiness across the land. He's not talking about a doctrine. Yes, it is a doctrine, but he's talking about an experience. We want people to enter into this experience of God's love so it would transform them, and they did it. They began to see it move across the land, lives being changed, and it radically altered the very profile of the nation because people were entering into this experience of perfect love. I, uh, I was reading uh, a report on the 1995, the Toronto Blessing, some fellow walked into the, uh, remember, uh, we have some people in our church that were in Toronto when the revival broke. They were in that church. They said, you need to understand that church wasn't but about 150 people when the revival came. <laughs> of course, it's a massive church now. But this fellow who came into it when it was just a small church, this is what he said, this is what he saw. He said, uh, God has poured his spirit out on a people in an improbable little church and they are now spending their time from morning to night giving away as fast as they can what God is giving to them. Giving away what God is giving to them. I want to encourage you guys to think about that. <laughs> God is giving you a lot over these last several months. Begin to ask the Lord every day, Lord, give me someone to give it away to. <laughs> I mean, you don't have to make it happen. You don't have to leverage it to happen just say lord would you give me an opportunity where somebody mentions something or they have a need and i can pray for them and believe that what you're putting in me can be transferred into them i, I want to encourage you to act in faith you many of you have experienced god in these weeks you've experienced his presence you experienced his work within you now i want to encourage you to take the next step and believe him that what he's put in you can be transferred into other people just by ministering to them and loving on them and praying for them. And every day there should be expectation to say, God, how can we begin to bless this community with what you're blessing us with to transfer it into other lives? I remember in the Asbury Revival, 1970. I would say this, the two revivals that I've been in, 
one of the things I noticed is how easy what God has given you can be transferred. It's, in the Asbury Revival, we would go to other schools. We'd just simply share a few words about what God was doing at Asbury, and the Spirit would fall in power. And I, I want to encourage you, as God is bringing this time of refreshing among you, believe that it can be transferred, this refreshing can be transferred into the people you come in contact with every day. And give yourself to that. Tomorrow, launch out and say, God, who do, who do you want me to bless today? <laughs> who do you want me to pray for, to encourage, to share with? And watch what the Lord begins to open up and watch how it begins to affect them. Go with expectation, believing that when you pray for someone or you bless someone, you're going to see a transference of God's grace into their life. Again, I, I remember during the um, outpouring of, of the Spirit in Toronto, uh, Randy Clark, who was the, the guy who went up to Toronto and the Spirit fell under his ministry, he was down in Vero Beach, Florida, and he was in a studio, a radio studio, and they were interviewing him about the revival in Toronto. And uh, as they were interviewing him, the power of God came on the studio. And the guy that was up at the soundboard, uh, the Spirit overcame him. And uh, they kept talking and kept sharing about what was going on. And the, the radio manager said this, We have received at least a dozen verifiable, credible, reliable comments from people who told us that when they switched on the radio, they were suddenly, unexpectedly overwhelmed by the presence of God. <laughs> As a matter of fact, he said some of them had to pull off the road. They were so overwhelmed by God's presence. You see, the Lord's presence can be transferred even over airwaves. And, and you say, well, can it be transferred if there's no revival? Yes, it can be. But the, the greatest intensity of that transfer is during an outpouring of the Spirit. And so you're seeing a greater level of the Lord working here. Believe for a greater level of the Lord working out there. And watch what he begins to do. As you say, Lord... You're, you're blessing us here. You're giving more of yourself in such sweet and wonderful ways. Now, we're going to believe you to begin to move that through us into the community, into the people that are around us, to bless them, to encourage them. And then watch what the Lord does as, as you move out with expectation in that area. Let me share this, and then we're, um, what do we do? Is Ralph go back into worship? Or? We'll go back into worship, and then we'll have a time of ministry. But uh, this is a... Uh, a young girl, Teresa of Lasso, she was, uh, she was a nun, but she was seeking after God for a greater experience of his, his love. And the Lord came upon her in a personal encounter with his love. And this is what she says. She said, I was seized with such a violent love for God that I cannot explain it except by saying that it was as if I had been totally plunged into fire. Oh, what fire. And what sweetness at one and the same time. I was burning with love. After that experience, she had wrestled with what God wanted her to do with her life. And one day, when she was reading in 1 Corinthians uh, 12 and 13, the Lord spoke to her, and, she, and this is what she said. Uh, it, she felt like he had, get, he had given her her calling. Then, in the excess of my delirious joy, I cried out, O oh Jesus, my love, at last I have found my vocation. My vocation is love. That's our vocation. It's your vocation. I, I believe God is giving you love. I believe he wants to give you more love. And I'm praying that we would again see these massive outpouring of love that we witness in the revivals of the Wesleys and the revivals of the, Ho the holiness movement, that God would again pour out his love, as, as was witnessed in Sarah Edwards' life. So let me pray for you. We're going to go back into worship, and then Ralph's going to come and, and lead us in ministry. Lord, we're grateful. We're grateful for your incredible love for us, God. Father, you... Your love for us, we see it in Jesus that you, you gave your son for the world. You gave your son for each of us. 
And we're so grateful for this expression of love. And we're so grateful that we can feel within our hearts your love for us. But Father, we also want to know your love for your son. Lord, I want to pray that there would be such an outpouring of love upon this church. That people's hearts would be melted into a fiery love for Jesus. Because they're picking up on your the currents of your love for, for your son. And I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing here. I pray for increase. I pray for, Lord, uh, a, a greater working of your love flowing in this place to transform and to change not only individual lives but to change a community. We love you tonight, Lord. We love you, and we pray that your expression of love would increase even more in our hearts and spirits. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. I want to ask you to close your eyes for a minute. I just want to invite you to ask the Lord to fill you with his love. Just as that description to melt our hard hearts into a fiery stream of love that we would be touched in a way that is something we can't manufacture. Well, we want to know your love. We want your love flowing in us. Lord, show us any obstacles to that. That whether there's sin whether there's hurt from the past, unforgiveness, just a distracted spirit. Doubt, fear, idolatry in our lives. that by your spirit you would cleanse us completely and fill us completely with your Holy Spirit and release your love in us that we would know and give that kind of love move in us Altar's open for prayer, and let's just join together in worshiping him as a